Hello, welcome to week 10 of Language and Style. This week is going to focus on mind style. Uh, this is a week that's going to bring together uh, many of the things that you've looked at in terms of different stylistic frameworks that you've encountered over this course. Uh, my name is Dr Jessica Mason, I'm a member of the English language team. Uh, you probably won't have met me so far this year uh, because this is the first week that I'm doing on language and style. Uh, I teach a lot of the modules at uh, third year so you'll probably uh, see me more uh, when you get there next year. But I'm really excited today to talk to you about mind style uh, which will be one of the options for your final assignment. So what is mind style? Well, mind style is a term that we use in stylistics uh, that looks at how different minds are represented in both fiction and non-fiction. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on fiction today, but one of the examples that you have in one of the tasks is looking at how mind style is used in animal documentaries to represent the minds uh, and behaviours of animals as though they are thinking, uh, intelligent, uh, beings that make decisions much in the way that humans do. So a mind style, I think Samino offers a very good definition of, of it here. She says that a mind style captures those aspects of worldviews that are primarily personal and cognitive in origin, and which are either peculiar to a particular individual or common to people who have the same cognitive characteristics. Uh, and just follows this up with saying, mind style represents an individual's cognitive uh, characteristic, cognitive habits, abilities and limitations. So we could argue that whenever uh, a character talks to us in fiction, uh, especially if they are talking to us as the reader uh, in their role as the narrator, as opposed to uh, when they're interacting with other characters, um, that they represent to us a particular mind style. We have a sense that they have a mind that works in the same way as our own. And the stylistic choices that authors make inform and help to construct and create what we think this person's mind is like. Very often, mind style is an approach which is utilised in stylistics when we're thinking about minds that are uh, atypical in some way. So I've got a few examples for you here uh, down at the bottom of the slide. So we often see child narrators represented through interesting techniques that are deployed in their mind style. So if you've ever read something like The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas, uh, or any other text that is narrated from the point of view uh, of a child, you find that there are decisions that the author makes, different choices, where you don't necessarily need to be told that this is a younger narrator, but you can tell from the way in which the text is written. And we're going to unpick a little bit in this lecture how that works and how those stylistic choices help us to understand that. We also see um, non-neurotypical minds very often represented using interesting choices to construct a very distinctive mind style. So things like the curious incident and the dog in the nighttime, uh, if anyone's ever read The Rosie Project, these are both uh, representations of uh, narrators who uh, have some sort of autistic spectrum disorder or something similar. And again, when you read these texts very quickly, you can tell this from reading. You don't actually need to be told that the narrator is not neurotypical. You pick it up. And I'm going to suggest to you today that you pick it up because of the stylistic choices that the author has made that go into constructing this very distinctive mind style. Elizabeth is Missing is another good example of this. This is a fantastic book that we talk about in more detail uh, in the final year module, Language Learning and Wellbeing, um, where the narrator is an 85 year old woman called Maud and Maud has dementia. Uh, and again, as you progress through the text, you can tell very quickly that perhaps Maud's memory isn't quite right. Perhaps there's, there's something about how she sees the world, these characteristic cognitive habits, abilities and limitations that Samina was talking about come through in the way in which she's, this, this text is written, the way in which this narrator speaks to us. And again, we see this in all sorts of um, other texts to different kind of degrees. Uh, texts like Enduring Love, Perfume, Catcher in the Rye, uh, the poem Havisham, where perhaps we're not talking about something which is clearly able to be defined into a group of people, but there is something distinctive about the way in which this narrator is speaking to us that uh, seems interesting and merits further stylistic investigation. So one of the things I'm going to talk to you about in the lecture today is naive mind styles. This is a very, very common uh, technique that is deployed where if we are trying to convey to a reader that uh, the person who is narrating this story to us is perhaps 
a little bit innocent, perhaps they're a bit more naive, perhaps they don't understand the world in quite the level of complexity or nuance, or possibly just in a very different way than we do. Um, the, what is often deployed is, is a way of constructing a naive mind style. So thinking back to things like the boy in striped pyjamas or room, which is uh, one of the options for your uh, assignment for this uh, particular framework, that we get the scene that is narrated through the perspective of a character who seems to have less or different understanding of the events that are going on than the reader. Uh, so this is an approach which is typically used with child characters or characters with unusual or atypical mind styles. What we're going to look at today, and I'm going to talk to you in detail about now, uh, is a fantastic uh, work of science fiction called Flowers for Algernon. I'm not going to tell you too much about the book initially, I'm going to sort of introduce that to you as we move through this session. I'm going to suggest that it's going to be really useful for you uh, to have some uh, note paper and a pen uh, with you or have another document open that you're able to type in because there's going to be points in this lecture when I'm going to ask you to pause the video, have a go at this yourself, and then I'm going to walk you through what a mind style analysis might look like. Flowers for Algernon is a particularly interesting example of mind style representations in fiction because, as I'm going to explain to you as we move through the session, this isn't a mind style which remains consistent throughout the book but which changes gradually in some quite distinctive ways that helps to feed the plot and the uh, narrative arc of this story and I'm going to explain to you how that works as we go through. But let's start then with having a look at a section from the opening few pages of Flowers for Algernon. I'm going to show you uh, the, the first bit of text. This is a text which is narrated from the point of view of Charlie who is our protagonist uh, and it's written as a series of scientific reports uh, that he's keeping in a journal which uh, the reasons for which will become clear as we progress through the narrative but I'm going to show this to you I'm going to pose a question and I'm going to ask you to have a look at this extract pause the video and see if you can just see if you can identify some of the different techniques that have been deployed in their use of constructing this mind style now one of the reasons that we leave this framework this approach to this point in the module is there are all sorts of different stylistic techniques that authors may engage with and often they will engage in quite different ones in order to construct distinctive mind styles. So we have to do a little bit of investigation to work out what it is that's been going on. So you may in particular want to think back to right in the early weeks of the module, thinking about foregrounding, thinking about different lexical choices that have been made. You might want to think uh, about different forms of speech and thought representation. You might want to think about transitivity, but just sort of run through that little mental inventory of this stylistic toolkit you've been gathering with Alison over the course of this module and see if you can notice any of the things that have been used in order to give us a sense of what this character is like. So here is our first extract. This is from the first page. It's the very opening to the book. and I'm just going to read it for you now. Progress Report 1, March 3rd. Dr. Strauss says I should write down what I think and remember and everything that happens to me from now on. I don't know why, but he says it's important so that they will see if they can use me. I hope they use me because Miss Kenyon says that maybe they can make me smart. I want to be smart. My name is Charlie Gordon. I work in Donna's Bakery where Mr. Donna gives me $11 a week and bread or cake if I want. I am 32 years old and next month is my birthday. I told Dr. Strauss and Professor Nima I can't write good, but he says it don't matter. He says I should write just like I talk and like I write compositions uh, in Miss Kenyon's class at Beekman College Centre for Retarded Adults, where I go to learn three times a week on my time off. Dr. Strauss says to write a lot everything I think and everything that happens to me, but I can't think anymore because I have nothing to write, so I will close for the day. Yours truly, Charlie Gordon. So I'm going to uh, display this back up on the screen for you in a moment, but I'm just going to pose you a couple of questions now. What are your initial impressions of the style of this text? And what are your first thoughts about the narrating character? You might want to think about what are they like? What do you think Charlie is like? What's their story? Who are they? Uh, what's your sense of this character? Where are these ideas coming from? So when you think about this is your idea of what Charlie's like, these are your initial impressions of the character, try and look back at this extract and see if you can identify where you think those ideas that you have about Charlie are coming from based on the stylistic choices that have been made in this text. So here it is again. I'm going to ask you to pause the video now, take a couple of minutes, uh, and then play whenever you're ready, uh, and I'll talk you through some of the things that I might say if I was going to engage in some close stylistic analysis of this extract.
Okay, so the first thing that I would probably comment on and jumps right out of us when we look at this text is the external deviation in terms of the non-standard spelling. So there are lots of distinct ways in which Charlie is spelling things here uh, that don't correlate to uh, our knowledge of accurate spelling in standard English register. Now, I've just highlighted for you here uh, some of the examples of this and if I was going to talk about this text this would be because I think it's the most obvious thing probably the thing that I would talk about in an analysis first and I would perhaps pick out a few of these examples to offer some textual evidence for where I'm getting this idea from. So clearly the writing style is non-standard um, but it's interesting then to think about, this is our initial impression, this is a pattern that we've identified, can we go any further? Let's have another look specifically at what kind of non-standard writing style we're dealing with here. So we're not just spotting the feature and then moving on, we're investigating and thinking carefully about the effect of this feature. So here it is again, and here are these examples, and you might just again want to just pause the video for a moment and think about, is there anything more that we could say about the particular manner of these non-standard spellings. So if you look closely at this, one of the things I think is very interesting to notice is the punctuation is actually accurate in places. So we have full stops, we have capitals at the start of sentences, uh, but not in others. Uh, there are no possessive apostrophes, there are patchy use of capitals for proper nouns, so if we see, for example, uh, at, the, at the start, we have a capital letter. Uh, at the start of the next sentence where he says, my name is Charlie Gordon, we have a capital letter there. Um, we have got some use of full stops. There are no commas, there are no semicolons, there are no colons. Uh, we have things like don't, so we have a contraction, but there's no apostrophe uh, there. So there is something interesting that we could then identify and we're thinking about what Charlie's narrating to us, he's talking about going to school, he's talking about learning, and he seems to have some of it right. We've got some places where things like Miss Kenyon and Mr Donner are in capitals, but then if we look a little bit further down to Dr Strauss and Professor Nima, uh, we've got capitals on the S and the N, but no capitals on the D or the P. So here's an interesting observation that we could make. The spelling is also accurate in some places, but not in others. And most of the inaccuracies, if we wanted to go even further, we could say that they're semi-phonetic. They're spelt how they might sound. So things like progress reports and March, we've got a T in March. Now, there is no T in March, but when we say the word March, we can understand how somebody might make that mistake. Um, it's something where somebody seems to have tried. Again, if we look down near the bottom, things like everything and happens, are very close to being accurate. I should write down consistently doesn't have a W at the, at the start, but when we say the word right, we can't hear that W sound, that is silent. So again, we can see that there are many words here that Charlie has got right. He's not somebody who's completely illiterate, he's not incapable of writing, but he's got some issues with spelling here. So if I was doing this analysis, one of the things I might conclude here is that actually we can take our examination of the deviations in his spelling and his writing style uh, and in his punctuation and make uh, some sort of claim about the effect of the mind style that's being represented here is something like this. So Charlie is not illiterate and he doesn't completely lack knowledge of grammar and spelling. Um, he clearly struggles but has made quite a lot of effort to get it right. So we are talking about some sort of naive uh, mind style going on here. Interesting too that he describes himself as being 32 years old, which people will often comment as being a bit of a surprise because they might expect that this is the writing style of a younger character, a younger narrator. And interesting too to think about this idea of mind style and where we get those ideas from, that perhaps we engage that idea of, oh, okay, I seem to be dealing with a younger narrator here now, and then as soon as he tells us that he's 32, we think, okay, there's something a little bit different going on here. This first assessment that I have of this character's mind isn't quite right. Interesting too to look at the respectful forms of address whenever he refers to any other character, uh, which again I think is characteristic, we might think, of a younger mind style. So interesting to think about the power dynamics that Charlie has with these other characters that he's describing and the way in which he sees himself relative to other people. He seems to think about himself as somebody who has less power, who should be using more formal forms of address. So we have everything from Dr Strauss and Miss Kinian 
uh, to Professor, and also talking about Mr Donner as the man that he works for. And I would suggest that in most cases, it's a little bit unusual to describe your boss uh, using this particularly formal form of address. Perhaps less unusual to refer to a teacher uh, in this way with uh, Miss as a title and then a surname. But then when we think about adults interacting in a learning environment, perhaps that feels a little bit more unusual. So I would suggest that Charlie's forms of address here, uh, if I was going to write this up into a stylistic analysis, suggest that he lacks power relative to the other person in all of the social relationships he discloses to us. Um, his use of doctor and professor isn't out of the ordinary for an adult addressing or discussing another adult who has this title. So it's not particularly unusual in a university context for you to talk about Dr. Alison Gibbons um, or Professor Chris Hopkins, but it is unusual to talk about your boss and your teacher in this particular regard. So again, we can take this initial impression about, we could talk about forms of address, and then we can hone in and get really specific and talk about some of the variations, some of the nuances in the stylistic effect that's being created. There are other comment features that we might comment on, and I would suggest that this is, is quite interesting, in particular when we're thinking about the content, not just the stylistic representation of what Charlie's saying to us. So I think it's quite interesting, this sentence, I don't know why, but he says it's important, so they will see if they can use me. This might raise questions for the reader, like, use him for what? Um, if Charlie doesn't know why he's writing these reports, is he able to consent to be involved in whatever these doctors have planned? So we might talk about feeling some sort of anxieties or worries for the well-being of this character. Is he being taken advantage of? These are all things that we can draw out from this initial extract. At the Beekman College Centre for Retarded Adults, where I go to learn, retarded, which is a, a, a non-standard way of, of the word retarded, is a lexical choice which gives us a clue about when this story is taking place. Um, this is a word which we don't tend to use anymore. It's generally considered quite offensive and not politically correct, not an appropriate form. But he's talking about it as though it's the title of the college. It's not, it doesn't seem to be his lexical choice. It's something that he's repeating. So perhaps this gives us a sense that this story is set in an older time period somewhere in the past. $11 a week is another interesting one. Again, uh, the word dollars suggests to us that perhaps this story is taking place in the United States or another country that uses dollars. I would comment that perhaps $11 seems quite a small amount for a week's worth of work, but there are questions that we have here that we're going to have to find out as we progress through the story. Is this $11 because this is set in a, a time period which is further back in the past, where actually that's a reasonable amount to be paid? Or are there some suspicions that we might have uh, building on these initial ideas about Charlie seems to be, be complying to this request to write things. He doesn't know why he's doing it, he, but he seems happy to go along with it. So we might raise questions about whether or not Charlie's being taken advantage of. Let's have a look then at a, another extract, which is just a few pages later, and see if we can develop our understanding of this mind style of how it's being constructed and how it is creating this character of Charlie for readers in their minds. So I'm going to read this to you, and then again, I'm going to pose you a couple of questions and ask you to take a few minutes to pause the video and see if you can observe uh, whether these patterns that we've initially identified are being continued in this extract, are the stylistic choices consistent, and is there anything else that we could comment on as we build this picture of how Charlie is being represented to us. So he says, this is three pages later, I hope I don't have to write too much of these progress reports because it takes a long time and I get to sleep very late and I'm tired at work in the morning. Gimpy hollered at me because I dropped a tray full of rolls I was carrying over to the oven. They got dirty and he had to wipe them off before he put them in to bake. Gimpy hollers at me all the time when I do something wrong, but he really likes me because he's my friend. Boy, if I get smart, won't he be surprised? So take a minute now to pause this video and I'll display it back up for you on the screen. And this is a question I'd like to pose to you. What does this passage add to our knowledge and our sense of the character of Charlie? So here's the abstract again. If you take uh, as much time as you'd like to pause and see what kind of st stylistic features you can spot. Okay. So if I was doing this analysis, here are some of the things that I would comment on. Uh, let's take it uh, at 
one step at a time as we go through and start with this first sentence. It says, I hope I don't have to write too much of these progress reports because it takes a long time and I get to sleep very late and I'm tired at work in the morning. So straight away we can see the same patterns we've observed in his non-standard spelling, this external deviation, uh, as being consistent. Again, we've got capitals uh, in some places um, and we've got a full stop. So we've got a sense that this punctuation uh, style is being con is continuing. Uh, there is some sense that Charlie is literate, but that he has problems. But interesting to think about and reflect on the content of this sentence too. So this is a suggestion that writing these progress reports that we're reading is quite onerous for Charlie. It takes a lot of effort. Um, it's to the extent that he's getting to sleep very late. He's not looking after himself properly and is tired when he goes to his job. So it doesn't seem to occur to Charlie that he could refuse to write the progress reports or just to write less of them so that it wouldn't take him so long. This, I would suggest, fits with these initial observations we made about these formal naming strategies of talking about doctor and professor and mister and miss. Um, it reflects that he views these people with unquestioning authority, that he is in a position of less power. He's been told to do something by these people and therefore he believes that the only choice that he has is to do it. Most of these progress reports, and obviously you can't see this uh, from the extracts that I'm showing you, so you'll just have to take my word for it, but most of them are very short, um, a page and a half at most. So there's some sort of observation we could make there too about Charlie's disclosure that they take him a very long time to write, give us a sense about feeding our, our idea about a, a really eager character, um, someone who has a mind which is, is perhaps naive, but is very eager to uh, comply, eager to please, but someone who struggles academically because the length of these reports give us a sense about how much work Charlie's having to put in in order to complete them as he's been asked. Equally, we see uh, an interesting change here, so we could observe a slight difference. So he's talking about his friend Gimpy. Uh, Gimpy doesn't get a mister or a miss, so we could suggest perhaps this is a, a social relationship that we're being introduced to between Charlie and another character that is more equal, um, or certainly that Charlie views it in that way. But that's not necessarily reflected in his verb choices, so it is consistent with the way in which he's naming Gimpy. But if we have a look uh, at the two verb phrases that he attributes to, to Gimpy, both of them are hollering, so shouting. We don't tend to think about people who have equal relationships, people who are friends, and indeed at the end of the passage he discloses that he views Gimpy as a friend, um, as someone who would shout at each other. There's also a phrasal repetition there. If he, he uses the same uh, distinctive verb choice, hollers, Again and again, we could perhaps go so far as suggesting this foregrounds a lack of creativity in Charlie's writing style. Um, he hasn't thought to use, to change it up and use a different verb phrase, he just repeats the one again and again. If we wanted to be really fancy, we could even talk about this bit at the end where he says, but he really likes me because he's my friend. This starts to build an impression that this mind style perhaps isn't as good. This isn't a, a character who's very good at kind of logical reasoning. Um, he's got this coordinating conjunction because, which normally offers us an explanation of the thing which comes before uh, in the sentence. But here there's really uh, just a repetition. He really likes me because he's my friend. So this penultimate sentence doesn't really fit. Uh, with the use of because here. So we might think about that as something might, which might merit commenting upon. Again, thinking about the content of what um, Charlie is actually telling us about here, this, I think, uh, really foregrounds this naive focalisation, this idea that this mind style that we're being introduced to has less understanding than the reader about what's actually going on in the things that they're describing. So he says, uh, talking about these roles that Gimpy dropped, they got dirty and he had to wipe them off before he put them in to bake. Now, I would suggest that in most bakeries, if you drop some rolls that haven't been cooked on the floor, the appropriate thing to do is put them in the bin, especially if you judge them to be dirty. Um, but Charlie is just telling us this descriptively, this is a thing that happens. Even though later at the passage, he talks about when I do something wrong. So he's clearly familiar with the notion of right and wrong. It's not that he doesn't have a sense that there are bad things that you can do. He just doesn't perceive this particular act as being something which is wrong or inappropriate. So there's an interesting idea that's going on here about it's okay for Gimpy to shout at him. 
Um, and it's okay for Gimpy to pick up these rolls and put them back into the oven. So this, I would suggest, kind of feeds our idea that he still has these socially unequal relationships, that he lacks power in all of the relationships that we've been introduced to so far. This is a stylistic te technique called naive focalization, um, or constructing a naive mind style. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the plot of this story, and I'm going to keep this whole lecture spoiler free uh, in case you would like to go off and read the text for yourself. Um, but I told you that this is a mind style uh, that changes as we move through the book, and it's one of the things that uh, this, this text was particularly kind of credited for. So we find out uh, in a few pages after the extract that you've just seen that this thing that the doctors and professors want to use uh, Charlie for is as the first human um, guinea pig, first human participant uh, to try out this new drug that they have been developing that makes people more intelligent. They've tried it out on a mouse uh, called Algernon, uh, who is the eponymous Algernon in the name, Flowers for Algernon, um, and they've given it to this mouse and this mouse has become incredibly intelligent. So having trialled it out on this mouse and done their animal testing, they now want to take Charlie as an adult who's got a relatively low IQ, who's got some uh, difficulties with learning, and give this text, uh, give this drug to him to see what's happened. So I'm going to show you this new extract now, which is 70 pages later in the text, uh, it's roughly about halfway through uh, from the first one. And can you see what kind of things have happened between that page and this one? June 5th, Nima is upset because I haven't turned in any progress reports in almost two weeks, and he's justified because the Welberg Foundation has begun paying me a salary out of the grant so that I won't have to look for a job. The International Psychological Convention at Chicago is only a week away. He wants his preliminary report to be as full as possible, since Algernon and I are the prime exhibits for his presentation. Our relationship is becoming increasingly strained. I resent Nima's constant references to me as a laboratory specimen. He makes me feel that before the experiment, I was not really a human being. So I'm going to uh, ask you a few more questions, ask you again to pause this video and make some notes, see if you can uh, do these observations yourself. How has the style of the text changed? And try and be as specific as you can. What is a really useful way to approach this is to look at that initial list of things that we talked about, about in those first extracts, and compare them with the features here. So we talked about things like non-standard spelling, forms of address, we talked about naive focalisation, about Charlie's uh, unequal power relationships, and about his lack of understanding about what's going on. So those would all be good initial reference points, and then see if there's anything else that you'd like to observe as well. The second question I then want to pose to you is if we think about I'm suggesting to you that these stylistic choices are the things that construct our sense of character. How has this change in style, this change in mind style that we're being represented, altered your sense of the character? So here again is the extract, and I'd ask you to pause the video now and have a go at this. Okay, so here are some of the observations I would make if I was writing this up into a stylistic analysis. Uh, and indeed, this is something that I have done uh, and was published in a, uh, a magazine for English teachers who were interested in teaching stylistic analysis to their class. Uh, and I've popped on the blackboard for you the written up version of this analysis if you would like to see what this kind of thing looks like in a written up version, which you may find useful for your own assignments. So the first thing I would notice straight away is that Nima has uh, lost this formal title. There is a change in the form of an address. And I might speculate, because again, we're thinking about not just spotting the feature, but talking about the effect, that this perhaps reflects a change in the power dynamics in the relationship. And again, this I would suggest is reflected in some of the content of what Charlie's uh, talking about here. So not only have we lost this form of address, but it's consistent with the kind of things he's now saying about this other character. He's saying he hasn't turned in any progress reports in almost two weeks. That offers a very stark contrast with the character at the start of this text who was staying up late and being tired for work in order to do these progress reports for him. I would also suggest there's a much more nuanced understanding of both uh, reflecting on Charlie's own mind and the minds uh, of others and their emotions. So uh, if we look back to that initial extract, there's no sense of why people are doing the things that they're doing, that they have minds, that they're making informed decisions, that they're reacting based on 
desires or wants or needs or emotions but that is very very different to the representations that we get here Nima is upset there's an assessment there that this mind style is now one which reflects a character who can look at another person and not only see what they're doing but understand why they might be doing it and again if we look at this use of because and contrast it to the use of because when he was talking about Gimpy in the previous extract we can see that this does this time reflect a much more nuanced understanding of why Nima is upset. He's justified because, again, we get this, this much more um, elaborated uh, explanation. He talks for the first time about how something makes him feel uh, before he just describes uh, processes, things that, that happen to him, and here we get uh, a much more nuanced understanding of this. We could also comment on other things. We have a much more diverse lexus. So if you remember back to the previous extract, I talked about the repetition of hollers, which perhaps reflected a lack of creativity, a lack, lack of range uh, in vocabulary choice. Whereas here we've got much more elaborated noun phrases um, and much more complex syntax, much more diverse than things, the laboratory specimen, all spelled uh, in uh, an accurate form in relation to standard English. We've got pre-modification, uh, things like preliminary, prime, exhibit, um, laboratory that we, we haven't had before. Uh, so there is evidence in the stylistic choices that are being made here that this is a mind which is now more academically able, that is thinking in much more elaborated ways. So these noun phrases have become longer. We can also see there are more complex phrase structures. Uh, there is use of more comprehensive range of punctuation. So we talked in the first two extracts about how we had some patchy use of capital letters uh, and some use of full stops, but that was it. Whereas here we have parentheses, we've got brackets, we've got use of appropriate use of apostrophes. Um, we have a much longer, more complex sentences. So hopefully you can see that all of these different things that you have been looking at in different stylistic frameworks have all been brought in different ways to bear on constructing this mind style and reflecting to the reader that we don't actually need to be told that this drug that they've given Charlie has worked and that he has become more intelligent. We can tell from the stylistic choices that have been made that it's reflected back of us in the, the things that Charlie is saying to us. Let's look at one more example. This is uh, another 18 pages uh, on. And again, I'm going to read it to you and then just ask you to take a minute to pause um, and ask if you could make any observations about what you think is going on in the plot of this narrative. So the last one was on June 8th, this June 5th. This is now June 8th, just three days later. What drives me out of the apartment to prowl through the city? I wander through the streets alone, not the relaxing stroll of a summer night, but the tense hurry to get where? Down the alleyways, looking into doorways, peering into half-shuttered windows, wanting someone to talk to and yet afraid to meet anyone, up one street and down another, through the endless labyrinth, hurling myself against the neon cage of the city, searching for what? So if you just pause the video now uh, and see if you can make any observations. I'm particularly interested if you could make any, um, notice any patterns in the stylistic choices that seem to have changed between this extract a mere 11 pages before and this one, are there any things which support um, and, and reinforce the patterns that we've identified? And are there any new things that have emerged? And what might that suggest to us about this character? I'll give you a moment now to just have a go at this yourself. So I would suggest uh, that there are some really interesting things that have gone on here where we again have lots of things that reinforce the same patterns that we've observed. We can see this more complex use of punctuation. We've got question marks, we've got commas, we've got ellipses. But there is also uh, an introduction of many features of Charlie's writing. And remember that these are initially supposed to be progress reports. They're some sort of scientific uh, thing that actually bear more resemblance to literary texts than scientific reports. So we have a series of rhetorical questions. What drives me out of the apartment to prowl through the city, hurrying to get where, searching for what? There's a uh, interesting use of foregrounding for stylistic effect. It seems to be something that has been done deliberately. So if we look halfway through the passage at the verb choices, we see that they're all in this progressive form. We've got looking, peering, wanting, 
even we could comment perhaps that this is it's creating a rhetorical effect that we have a tripartite uh, thing going on here of this use of, of three looking peering wanting um again hurling is there as well searching uh, elaborated as we go through the passage and very interestingly we have uh, one of the first uses of me not only metaphors but quite novel metaphors he's talking about the neon cage of the city and if we compare this to these initial extracts we can see that something very interesting is going on here with the changing mind style of this character so some of the observations I might make is not only does this drug seem to have worked, but as we're progressing through the no novel, Charlie is becoming more and more intelligent. He's not only become as intelligent as perhaps, uh, you know, a, a regular member of the population. We seem to be progressing to perhaps some level of genius, some level of, of, of someone being a very highly intelligent person. We could take this even a step further about thinking about what drives me uh, searching for what. And if I was going to write up this analysis, I might make some very nuanced observations here about the fact that my initial uh, suspicion might be, OK, well, he's become intellectually curious. He's interested in his own mind. He's introspecting. He's reflecting on his own thoughts and behaviours in a way that he certainly wasn't doing at the beginning of this text. But then I might look back and say, mm, I'm not sure that that's quite right um because he's talking about being interested in things he's quite curious as a character at the start of the text uh, it just seems that post this operation post this drug that he's been given that he is his capacity to be curious and reflect on his own thinking is the thing that's dramatically increased so we could draw this out again and think about this is a mind style that all the way through has been represented to us as as a character who is curious but the key distinction in this mind style as it develops is that actually these cognitive habits have become, our limitations have been reduced, our abilities have been increased, and that that is reflected in his um, reflections that he's offering us in this passage. So that's all I'm going to talk to you about today. I appreciate that uh, uh, this video is uh, quite long already, and I don't want to overwhelm you, but here I hope you've had a good example of what mind style can look like and ways in which we can deploy our knowledge and draw on uh, this stylistic toolkit that you have been developing over the course of the module and bring it to bear and thinking about how characterization and in particular our, our sense of how minds fictional minds are constructed in fictional works actually happens what the nitty-gritty is of the process of how that's been done so i hope you've enjoyed this video uh, and i will um uh, look forward to hearing about how you get on with this in the live sessions and, and deal with the tasks. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your module and I will see you, I hope, at some point next semester.